So um, we're next going to go on to uh, vaccine safety. Um, and uh, Dr. Lee will uh, talk about vaccine safety technical support group VAST in the introduction. Uh, Dr. Lee, please. Thank you. And I wanted to um, thank my co-chair, uh, Dr. Robert Hopkins, who is also chair of NVAC. We have been on this journey together. Next slide. As a reminder, the COVID-19 vaccine safety technical subgroup, the objectives are to review, evaluate, and interpret post-authorization or post-approval COVID-19 vaccine safety data to serve as a central hub for technical subject matter expertise from federal agencies conducting post-authorization or post-approval safety monitoring, to advise on analyses, interpretation, and data presentation, and to provide these updates to the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Working Group and the ACIP on any COVID-19 vaccine safety issues. Next slide. VAST has met 24 times since last June and 10 times specifically since December 21st to review the post-approval vaccine safety data. And you can see in the middle, we've now added the Janssen vaccine that was approved on February 28th. Next slide. As a reminder, these are the vaccine safety surveillance systems engaged in the VAST meetings. And as mentioned in the prior um, ACIP meeting, vaccine safety monitoring has relied on vSafe, VA aiders, VAERS, and CISA early in the U.S. vaccination program as early detection systems for safety. But as we move along on the vaccine safety monitoring timeline, you can see that VAST will begin to rely more on the large linked databases, such as the VSD and CMS data, that can better assess the risk of adverse events of special interest within a defined population. I also just wanted to take a moment and thank our federal colleagues and their investigator teams who have been collecting and reviewing these data each week for presentation to VAST. It takes a tremendous amount of effort um, each week for the teams to do this work, and it requires them to be nimble, patient, and responsive to our many questions. So um, special thanks to all of them. Next slide. Um, as mentioned, uh, we do a weekly review of available data on vaccine administration and adverse events of special interest. Uh, shared learning with all members, federal partners, and subject matter experts who are present for the presentation of data. Uh, VAST members discuss these findings independently after our meetings. And then a summary and interpretation of aggregate data are provided to the ACIP Secretariat on a regular basis. Next slide. Fast topics covered since the last ACIP emergency meeting include a review of routine data from VAERS, VSAFE, the VA, VSD, and CMS, and additional review of special topics, including background rates for adverse events of special interest, maternal immunization, thrombocytopenia, multisystem inflammatory syndrome, and vaccination of persons with prior infection. We have also initiated what will become monthly sessions with additional experts to review data on vaccine safety in pregnancy. Next slide. For today's session, uh, Dr. Shima Bokoro will do a COVID-19 vaccine safety update overall, and with a special focus on maternal immunization today, uh, that was the request of our ACIP members from the last meeting. And we will conclude with a COVID-19 VAST subgroup discussion and interpretation of those data. Next slide. Just wanted to thank and acknowledge our VAST members um, who are meeting every week uh, for multiple hours for us to be able to review this information, uh, including my um, co-ACIP members, um, Dr. Bell, Daly, Ms. McNally, and Dr. Talbot as well as our expert consultants. And um, a special thanks to our CDC co-leads, um, Lori Markowitz and Melinda Wharton, who have been phenomenal at leading our group through this time. Next slide. And um, this is a short list of acknowledgements. There are many more people behind each of these teams, but just wanted to say thanks uh, again for all of their incredible work um, in monitoring vaccine safety uh, for the U.S. population. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Shima Bukuro. Thanks, Grace. Um, can you hear me okay? We can. All right. Um, 
Good morning or good afternoon. I'll be giving a COVID-19 vaccine safety update today. Next slide. Next slide. Topics I'll cover are a vSafe update, then a VAERS update, then a vaccine safety data link update, a clinical immunization safety assessment project update, and then I'll spend a little time um, going over COVID-19 vaccine safety in pregnancy. Next slide. I'll start off with vSafe. Next slide. So just to remind you, vSafe is our smartphone-based active surveillance system that uses text messaging with uh, links to web-based surveys um, to check, conduct health check-ins on individuals after vaccination. These check-ins occur daily, the first week uh, after vaccination, and then weekly through six weeks, and then at three, six, and 12 months. And this process basically resets um, when a person gets a second dose. The daily check-ins um, during the first week post-vaccination um, solicit responses on local and systemic reactions. And then um, after that, um, we don't ask about local and systemic reactions, but um, on, the, on all check-ins, there is a health impact assessment. And if an individual reports that they received medical care, um, that information is transmitted to a VAERS call center and the person is contacted and a VAERS report is taken if appropriate. We also have questions on the surveys um, to capture information on pregnancy status and um, for individuals who are pregnant at the time of vaccination, are we um, determining later on that they were pregnant or, or became pregnant shortly after vaccination? Um, when we attempt to enroll them in the vSafe pregnancy registry through a separate process. Next slide. So here are some, some basic uh, information on the immunization program and on vSafe. Um, at the time of this analysis in mid-February, there are approximately 55 million people receiving one or more doses of COVID vac vaccine in the United States. And there are roughly 3.9 million vSafe registrants that had completed at least one health check-in. And of these, there were just over 30,000 self-reported pregnancies in vSafe. Next slide. So this table is from a, a fairly recent publication in the MMWR on the initial safety findings um, for uh, mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. And this particular table focuses on vSafe data, in particular, reactogenicity. So again, looking at the first week, um, and in this case, looking at day one. And I just want to uh, let you know that d day one is actually the day after vaccination. Day zero is the day of. Day one is the day after. And we know from looking at the data that most reactogenicity or the highest amount of reactogenicity is reported on day one. And the comparison I want you to look at here is really looking at the two vaccines, the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccine, dose one, day one, compared to dose one, day one of the other vaccine. And, and if you look, um, uh, injection site reactions are commonly reported, and then systemic symptoms are also commonly reported. But if you just do a direct comparison, dose one, day one versus dose one, day one of the two vaccines, the safety profiles are, are, are consistent, um, quite similar. Um, probably the takeaway from this slide is that there is a substantial uh, amount of reactogenicity reported, and these vaccines are known to be reactogenic. Next slide. So this is looking just at the Pfizer vaccine, um, looking at dose one compared to dose two. The time of this analysis, we didn't have uh, information on the Moderna vaccine. We do now, and we'll be updating this analysis in the future. But for right now, if you look at dose one, day one of Pfizer compared to dose two, day one of Pfizer, um, what, what what's striking is that the, um, self, the, the the reported systemic reactions are substantially more um, following dose two. In some cases, three to four fold higher. So I think the take the takeaway from um, these 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 two analyses, the 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 one on the previous slide and this slide, is that um, the reactogenicity profiles based on on vSafe are consistent with what was observed in the clinical trials. Um, both the reactogenicity in general and the observation that there is more systemic reactogenicity after dose two. Next slide. 
So moving on to VAERS, VAERS is the nation's early warning system for vaccine safety. It's a spontaneous reporting or passive surveillance system that's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Next slide. Um, the strengths are, are VAERS. Of VAERS is it is national data, essentially at the entire U.S. population is eligible to get a vaccine is the covered population because of the the size and the and the breadth we can rapidly detect safety signals and can detect rare adverse events the main limitation is that um, VAERS is not designed to assess causality VAERS does accept all reports from everyone regardless of the plausibility of the vaccine causing the event or the clinical seriousness of the event it is a hypothesis generating system to identify potential safety concerns safety signals that can be studied in more robust data systems. Next slide. So this is the overall um, reports uh, following COVID-19 vaccines through February 16th. Um, just over 104,000 reports to VAERS, um, of which 94% are non-serious and 6% are serious. And that breakdown of non-serious and serious is similar to what we see for other vaccines administered to adults, such as uh, flu vaccine. Next slide. So here's a look at the at the um, specific adverse events and the side-by-side -side, um, tables with the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccine. And as you can see, um, systemic reactions are most commonly reported and local reactions are, are also commonly reported as well. Um, the uh, the uh, safety profiles um, for these two vaccines look remarkably similar when put side by side. And importantly, there were no empirical Bayesian data mining alerts detected for any adverse event COVID-19 vaccine pairs. So I think the take home from the vSafe data and the VAERS data are that the uh, initial safety profiles of these vaccines are consistent with what was observed in the clinical trials and are generally reassuring. Next slide. So I, I just want to give you an update on anaphylaxis following messenger RNA COVID-19 vaccines. Um, this is from a, a fairly recent publication in, in JAMA um, looking at both vaccines. And um, this is through January 18th. And um, after we accumulated additional data um, from the last time that we briefed you, um, we have updated reporting rates. Um, you see the bubble is kind of enlarged there. For the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, it's 4.7 million uh, cases, uh, I'm sorry, 4.7 cases per million doses administered. And for the Moderna vaccine, 2.5 cases per million doses administered. Next slide. So moving on to the vaccine safety data link, this is CDC's collaboration with nine participating integrated healthcare organizations with data on over 12 million persons per year. Next slide. So um, the vaccine safety data link has uh, electronic health record data and administrative data to include information on immunizations, um, encounters with the healthcare system, um, birth and death certificate information and demographics all linked by unique study IDs. The VSD also has rapid access to um, charts and electronic health records to go in and review cases as well. Next slide. So VSD is conducting near real-time sequential, um, near real-time monitoring called rapid cycle analysis. In RCA, um, the data are refreshed weekly. The outcomes that are monitored are pre-specified, so they're identified in advance. Um, it includes methods to adjust for sequential testing when sequential testing is performed. It is a surveillance activity, which is not the same as an epidemiologic study. It's designed to detect statistically significant associations and statistical signals, um, which are values above specified statistical thresholds. Not all statistical signals um, indicate a safety problem. They need to be assessed further. And when a statistically significant association or signal occurs, assessment involves a series of checks and evaluations, chart confirmation of the diagnosis to confirm or exclude the case as a true incident case is a key part of statistical signal assessment. Next slide. So the analyses that we are doing are, are, are planned for RCA and, and VSD are the unvaccinated concurrent comparators 
which is currently ongoing. The vaccinated concurrent comparators also currently ongoing. Self-controlled risk interval and historical comparators are planned and we'll initiate those shortly. Next slide. So here's the uh, 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 VSD COVID-19 vaccine doses administered um, by manufacturer through February 13th. If you see on the combined, uh, the combined graph there on the right-hand side, it's roughly 630,000 dose one doses and just over 200,000 dose two doses. Next slide. So this is the same data, but broken down by age group. And I think uh, if you focus again on the right-hand side, um, the total doses, um, I think the thing to note is that blue bar has um, increased as a proportion as time has gone on, um, likely indicating expansion of the vaccination program um, um, more towards the general population. So the 65 to 84 group um, expanding um, quite rapidly there. Next slide. So these are the preliminary results of the VSD unvaccinated concurrent comparator analysis for COVID-19 vaccine safety after either dose of any mRNA vaccine through February 13th. This is somewhat of a reference slide to show you the 21 pre-specified outcomes that are being monitored, but the unvaccinated concurrent comparator analysis is the analysis that uh, allowed us to get uh, data um, most quickly. Um, uh, it's uh, it's basically looking at vaccinated individuals compared to unvaccinated individuals matched on certain characteristics, um, and and did not really does not really re require a maturation of vaccinated individuals into the control window. So it it can give us information as soon as individuals begin to get vaccinated and as soon as events begin to accrue. Um, and the bottom line is there are no statistically significant increased risk detected for any of the pre-specified outcomes in the unvaccinated concurrent comparator analysis. Next slide. So this slide shows you the preliminary results of the sequential vaccinated concurrent comparator analysis um, for, for either dose of any mRNA vaccine as of February 13th. Again, no statistical signals detected. So this um, table only includes outcomes with events in the risk window. So if there wasn't an event in the risk window, there's really no analysis to be done. So um, those those outcomes are not included. And you might you may see um, in the column that says events in the risk in the interval, and then right next to it, it says adjusted expected events in the risk interval. You'll see some where there, there's the appearance of this imbalance, um, where there's columns in the, or there's there's um, cases in, in, in the risk interval and um, no adjusted expected events uh, in, in the risk interval. That's largely um, a result of, of um, limited follow-up time. Um, but when we do the sequential monitoring, we do not have any statistical signals to date. Next slide. So next steps for our VSD are a dose-specific analysis, a product-specific analysis, analyses for the two risk intervals, the one to 21 and one to 42 day risk intervals, and then a historical comparator analysis. Next slide. So moving on to the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project, which is a collaboration between CDC and seven participating medical research centers. Next slide. So um, the CISA Project COVID-Vax is, is an extension of the CISA Project's clinical consultation service for U.S. healthcare providers and health departments for complex COVID-19 vaccine safety questions and issues that are about an individual patient residing in the United States or are not readily addressed by CDC or ACIP guidelines. And the, the, the CISA team and its Partners includes um, individuals with vaccine safety subject matter expertise in multiple specialties and subspecialties. And the, you see the information there on the last bullet and sub bullets on, on how to request a CISA consult. Next slide. So CISA has responded to 331 clinical inquiries or consultation requests 
um, during the period December 14th, 2020 through February 10th, 2021. Um, these have really come from all over the United States, 43 states, um, greater than 90% from healthcare providers or health departments. The most common topics have been anaphylaxis and allergic reactions and nervous system disorders. Um, CISA has also assisted state health departments with evaluation of complex medical issues pertaining to COVID-19 vaccine safety and established a, a, a work group with allergy and immunology specialists to provide expert input on anaphylaxis and other allergic reactions to inform clinical considerations for use of COVID-19 vaccines and is engaged in ongoing work to investigate possible mechanisms for anaphylaxis after COVID-19 vaccine. And this is in collaboration with FDA, NIH, and other partners. Next slide. So now I'm, now I'm going to move into um, safety and pregnancy. Next slide. So this is the same slide I showed previously, but I'm highlighting um, the uh, the self-reported pregnancies to be safe, of which there are just over um, 30,000. And the next couple slides I'm going to show you um, look at look at these 30,000 individuals and are looking at reactogenicity. So next slide, please. So um, this is looking at day one post-vaccination local reactions in pregnant and non-pregnant women aged 16 to 54 years. So on the top there, we basically are looking at Pfizer, BioNTech, dose one, and then Moderna, dose one. And in the blue um, bar, you have self-reported pregnant women. And in the orange bar, these are non-pregnant women. And I think the take home from this is we're, we're not really seeing any substantial differences in uh, in, in local reactions um, between pregnant, self-reported pregnant women and non-pregnant women. In fact, there there may be um, a little bit less um, re reported local reactions um, in in pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women, although those are kind of small numbers. And then you have um, some data for the Pfizer BioNTech dose two down there, um, which looks actually pretty similar to dose one. Next slide. So this is day one post vaccination. This should actually be, I'm sorry, systemic reactions. That's a typo on that slide there. Um, first, looking at on the again on the top there, um, Pfizer BioNTech dose one and Moderna dose one. And again, when you're in uh, pregnant, self-reported self pregnant in blue and non-pregnant in orange. And when you're looking at these systemic um, symptoms, fatigue, headache, myalgia, chills, nausea, and fever, um, we're not seeing um, a safety problem with respect to these systemic symptoms in pregnant women um, compared to non-pregnant women. Um, in fact, there may be a little bit um, higher um, uh, self-reported systemic symptoms in non-pregnant women. Then if you look on the left-hand side and go from top to bottom, we have the Pfizer-BioNTech dose one compared to dose two. And I mean, similar to um, what I showed you previously, um, dose dose two is uh, there's um, substantially more systemic symptoms reported after dose two. But when you look at the comparison, um, between uh, pregnant, self-reported pregnant women and non-pregnant women, um, you're not seeing any um, concerning patterns there. Again, if anything, there's a little less systemic symptoms reported in pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women. Next slide. So moving on to the vSafe Pregnancy Registry. So vSafe participants who report pregnancy following COVID-19 vaccination are actively contacted to enroll in the Pregnancy Registry. Participants are contacted once per trimester, then after delivery, and when the infant is three months old. The outcomes of interest include miscarriage and stillbirth, pregnancy complications, maternal intensive care unit admission, adverse birth outcomes, neonatal death, infant hospitalization, and birth defects. Next slide. So um, as of February 19th, um, there is 1,815 pregnant women enrolled in the VSA Pregnancy Registry. I'll say that's um, uh, well past 2,000 by now. Um, in the enrolled population at this time, there, there had been 275 completed pregnancies, including 232 live births. Other outcomes included miscarriage, stillbirth, ectopal or tubal pregnancies. 
Next slide. So this uh, table here um, shows V-Safe Pregnancy Registry Outcomes of Interest in COVID-19 Vaccinated Women um, with a comparison to, um, to background rates. Um, so uh, on the left-hand side of this table here, you see we have pregnancy outcomes, pregnancy complications, and then neonatal um, events. And in the, um, the first column to the right, we have background rates um, based on published literature, and then the rates we're seeing in the V-Safe Pregnancy Registry overall. I think the take home here is when you compare um, the percentages um, in, in the V-Safe registrants compared to background rates, we're not seeing any concerning patterns um, with, with respect to the um, outcomes and events in the V-Safe Pregnancy Registry compared to what we would expect from background rates uh, uh, listed there in that middle column. Next slide. These are. This is just a reference slide for where we um, got those background rates. Next slide. So um, moving on to VAERS data, um, these are the characteristics of COVID-19 vaccine pregnancy reports to VAERS through February 16th, of which there are 154. Um, the median maternal age in these reports is 33, ranging from 16 to 51. Median gestational age is 13 weeks, ranging from 2 to 38. Just over half uh, of these reports um, involved um, pregnancies during the first trimester, about a third during the second and the, and the remainder in the third. And you see the vaccines there below at the bottom. Next slide. So this is looking at the adverse events in pregnant women um, following COVID-19 vaccine. And I just wanna take you to the bottom of this table first. You'll see that about um, 73%, so about three quarters of these 154 reports involve non-pregnancy specific adverse events. So adverse events you would expect just in the general population, um, which typically are systemic and local reactions as you see there. So of the 42 um, pregnancy or neonatal specific conditions, which is 27% of the total reports, um, Miscarriage was most commonly reported with 29 reports, and then you see small numbers of some of these other pregnancy or needle, neonatal specific conditions. So just to put that, uh, that the, those 29 reports of miscarriage into perspective, um, the frequency of clinically recognized early pregnancy loss for women aged 20 to 30 years is estimated to be between 9 and 17%. At age 30, it's 20%. At age 40, it's 40%. And age 45, it's 80%. And this comes from an ACOG practice bulletin. Um, so um, miscarriage is not an uncommon uh, uh, outcome of pregnancy. Next slide. So there are other um, some other activities, um, CDC COVID-19 maternal vaccination safety activities ongoing. Um, in the vaccine safety data link, um, there is a COVID-19 vaccination coverage project in pregnant women. There's a study on the risk of miscarriage and stillbirth following COVID-19 vaccination and a, and a safety and pregnancy study looking at acute adverse events, long-term safety assessment of acute adverse events, pregnancy complications and birth outcomes, and infant follow-up for the first year of life. There is a prospective observational cohort study planned in, in the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project, which is gonna look at adverse pregnancy and birth outcomes, serious adverse events, local and systemic reactogenicity, and infant health outcomes for the first three months of life. Next slide. So just to sum up maternal vaccination safety, uh, pregnant women were not specifically included in pre-authorization clinical trials of COVID-19 vaccines. So post-authorization safety monitoring and research are the primary ways to obtain safety data on COVID-19 vaccination during pregnancy. There have been substantial numbers of self-reported pregnant persons that have registered in vSafe. The reactogenicity profile and adverse events observed among pregnant women in vSafe did not indicate a safety problem. Uh, most reports to VAERS among pregnant women involve non-pregnancy specific adverse events, mainly local and systemic reactions. 
Miscarriage was the most frequently reported pregnancy-specific adverse event to VAERS. The numbers are within the known background rates based on presumed COVID-19 vaccine doses administered to pregnant women. And by presumed, um, what I mean is we, um, we, we don't know how many um, women out, pregnant women out there have been vaccinated, but um, we do know that there's been uh, just over 30,000 self-reported um, pregnant women just in VSAFE alone. So I think we can presume that there are tens of thousands of pregnant women that have been um, vaccinated. And based on the data we have right now, um, we don't see any evidence of a safety problem with respect to um, pregnant, uh, vaccination of pregnant women with COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide. So some closing thoughts. Um, 75 million COVID-19 vaccine doses have been administered in the United States through the end of February. The reactogenicity profiles of messenger RNA vaccines and vSAFE monitoring are consistent with what was observed in the clinical trials and systemic and local reactions are most commonly reported to VAERS. Anaphylaxis following both vaccines has been reported to VAERS, though rarely, and there's no other safety signals for serious adverse events that have been detected in VAERS. There's no safety concerns that have been detected among the VSD rapid cycle analysis pre-specified outcomes as of February 13th. No unexpected pregnancy or infant outcomes have been reserved, observed related to COVID-19 vaccination during pregnancy. And safety monitoring in pregnant women is ongoing and planned in VSAFE, VAERS, VSD, and CISA. Next slide. I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of investigators from the following organization, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for that detailed and informative uh, presentation, Dr. Shimabakuro. Um, we're gonna hold questions uh, until doc the end of Dr. Lee's presentation. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Lee to please uh, give her presentation on vast assessment of safety data. Dr. Lee. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, next slide, please. So we uh, continue to rely on our well-established vaccine safety surveillance systems that remain the cornerstone for monitoring the safety of approved COVID-19 vaccines in the U.S. Enhanced approaches to surveillance have enriched our understanding of COVID-19 vaccine safety in the early phases of vaccine deployment. And VAS continues to meet weekly to review all available data and to ensure a coordinated approach across multiple safety surveillance systems. Next slide. Local and systemic reactions continue to be the most commonly reported um, adverse events following vaccination in VSAFE, VAERS, and the VA system. Anaphylaxis reporting rates range from 2.5 to 4.7 cases per million doses administered and is the most common reason for CISA consultation, where we also have um, allergy and immunology specialists providing expert input on clinical considerations. Next slide. The VSD rapid cycle analysis uh, uses multiple methods for surveillance depending on the phase of the vaccination program. And I anticipate in the future, we'll continue to dive deeper into that VSD data. Pre-specified outcomes are actively being monitored and no statistical signals have been detected to date. We've also reviewed the CMS rapid cycle analyses um, plan. The descriptive analyses have been reviewed primarily with sequential analyses to begin soon. Next slide. A large number of pregnant women have chosen to receive COVID-19 vaccines in the US and a novel pregnancy registry in VSAFE was established to monitor pregnancy and birth outcomes. Um, and, and I just wanna state that, you know, again, we really appreciate how nimble CDC has been in establishing this. We were not anticipating uh, so many uh, pregnant women uh, would be interested in vaccination. And, and so this is a great opportunity to have a better understanding um, of the safety and outcomes. Similar to non-pregnant adults, pregnant women commonly report local and systemic reactogenicity such as pain, fatigue, and headache. And pregnancy and birth outcomes following COVID-19 vaccination appear similar to rates reported in the literature. Next slide. 
Since our last ACIP emergency meeting at the end of January, our colleagues have published two additional vaccine safety publications in MMWR and JAMA, as Dr. Shima Bukoro presented. Next slide. In addition, the CDC and FDA have each posted additional information on their web pages, and we anticipate that these will continue to be updated in the future. You can see the links to the lower left there. Next slide. In terms of vast plans for the future, um, I just wanted to start out by reminding folks that in, um, I believe it was September, uh, we um, uh, discussed that statistical signals should be expected in a robust monitoring program, and timely investigations will be conducted once statistical signals are identified. But only one in 10 statistical signals have turned out to be true associations based on our past experience. Maternal vaccine safety data from multiple sources will be regularly reviewed in collaboration with pregnancy experts. And future vaccine safety surveillance activities will now include the newly approved Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. FAST will continue to update the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group, the ACIP secretariat, and the full ACIP on a regular basis. Next slide. Just thanking my VAST members again. Um, thanks very much. And happy to uh, turn it back to Dr. Romero for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, open for discussions, questions, concerns. Uh, Dr. Hahn, please. Yeah, hi, thank you, Dr. Hahn from uh, CSPE. I had two questions. One is that um, in V-Safe, to my recollection, there's not just questions about pain, injection, you know, et, et cetera, but also whether those, ex, you know, cause you to limit your activities in any way and that type of thing. So sort of a severity indicator, if you will. Uh, but I haven't seen any, uh, and maybe I just missed it, but any reports on that, because we get that question so often, hey, is the second dose going to be, I had some bad reactions. The first one was the second dose worse. And I was just wondering what V-Safe is telling us. And then my second question uh, kind of related to that is, of course, there are certain people who after the first dose aren't going to get a second dose if they had a severe allergic reaction. But what do we know about people that did fine with that first dose? They go ahead and get the second dose. And how many are we seeing reports of anaphylaxis or severe allergic reaction amongst those people? Thank you. So to your first question, um, part of the V-Safe process is to, uh, if a person reports that they received medical care, um, really at any health check-in, um, there, there, there is an attempt to contact that person and take a VAERS report. Um, we're in the process of collecting that, that information um, and analyzing those reports, um, and we'll have to, to get back to ACIP later with, with what we're, we're, we're seeing on, for those, those I would call them V-safe generated VAERS reports. Um, there is some automated data, you're correct, where we um, can tell if people are, or where, where people self-report that they, they miss work or can't do eight daily activities. So we, I'll take that back to the VSAFE group and, and see what kind of um, analysis we can do with the data we have within VSAFE, um, maybe using that as a proxy measure for severity. And then um, your, your question about an anaphylaxis and what are we seeing with second um, second dose uh, for the um, actually if you could could you go to the could you go to that um, that slide where it's the screenshot of the table for the anaphylaxis slide 13 could you move to that slide we're doing so yeah there, okay so if you look uh, about two thirds of the way down here's what we have um for, for the most recent published data, most of the doses or most of the cases occur after first dose, and then there's a handful after second dose. Um, and this this was still fairly on in the immunization program, so it may re represent just just where we were with the rollout. Um, we've continued to monitor anaphylaxis. Um, we we still don't have a whole a lot of cases after second dose. Um, now uh, there there could be a variety of reasons for that. People maybe maybe practice maybe, maybe there's um, first dose impacts getting second dose. Um, I think we'll have to look at that information a little 
a little deeper, but we're still seeing the pattern where most of these anaphylaxis reports are after first dose and then a relatively small number after second dose. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, thank you. The CDC is doing an amazing uh, job in in monitoring the safety of uh, these COVID-19 vaccines and and uh, the clear presentations in in highlighting vaccine safety. Could you go to slide 11? Uh, um, of the, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, no, the next one. I guess I got that's 11. Yep. So I was wondering about uh, that. It looks like 6% of the serious adverse events um, occurred, but it uh, appears that there were less number of doses in Pfizer than there were in Moderna. And then when you look at the right-hand column, it looks like there are more than twice as many SAEs after Pfizer. Is that because it include, the data includes more dose number twos? Uh, I I I don't I don't know if that is I know if, I don't know if the reason for that is because there's more more dose number twos. I, I would just say these are th these are spontaneous reports, and so I mean the difference between 97 percent and three percent and 91 percent and nine percent. Um, when you're dealing with spontaneous reports, it's it's kind of hard to determine um, what kind of a difference, if if any, there is. I think when we, I mean, when we look at these, when we look at the uh, the, the the most common adverse events, um, the two vaccines look fairly comparable. So um, I I I don't know if in VAERS, um we're we're really going to be able to get in into in that. What is the what is the true difference there, if any, or what is the meaningful difference there? But I would say if you look at this general pattern. Um, around 90% non-serious and 10% serious, and, and, and that varies a little bit depending on the vaccine and also depending on the age of the of the individuals getting vaccinated. That is pretty standard for what we see for a lot of vaccines given to adults. Yeah, thanks. I was uh, surprised about the number that there were more uh, after Pfizer than Moderna from an absolute number. Um, I don't know. I wasn't suggesting it was clinically meaningful, but I was surprised. Can you also go to slide 21, please? Is there any, um, uh, can you comment at all about lymphadenopathy? Uh, lymphadenopathy, we have not included as a, um, as a pre-specified uh, adverse event in, in, in vaccines, in, uh, in, in VSD rapid cycle analysis, um, I, 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 there may be a variety of reasons for that. One is is, is whether or not it's medically attended. Um, typically, typically for VSD rapid cycle analysis events, they we want them to be medically attended. Um, those are those are events that are more conducive to monitoring um, and rapid cycle analysis. We'll say we have received um, reports. Of lymphadenopathy, lymphadenitis in VAERS. Um, there, there. Um, this was observed in the in the pre-licensed or clinical trials. Um, these tend to be um, mild, uh, not not serious, and, and self-limited, and resolve pretty quickly on their own. Um, so uh, we'll say that is an that is an adverse event that we have observed in our in our monitoring, particularly in, in VARES, But we have not seen any disproportional reporting for lymphadenopathy and do not have a, a safety signal for it. Um, and lymphadenopathy does occur in in other in, uh, with other vaccines as well. Thank you. If it's okay, Dr. Romero, I just wanted to chime in um, regarding Dr. Bernstein's first question and reiterate that uh, because VAERS is numerator only, uh, VAST uh, felt like it was hard to interpret that data given the greater number of Pfizer doses given overall in the U.S. at that cut. And also, um, specifically, there's you know differences in reporting behavior. So those are our people who actually report in. Uh, so I think there was a, a lot of reporting in and especially um, early on, which is terrific, and we definitely encourage that. Uh, but as there are changes over time in uh, reporting, then uh, we could see changes in those numbers that don't actually um, translate into differences in adverse events. 
Yeah. And I was thinking that three, the three week interval for Pfizer products, why there might be more dose two included, which is tends to be more reactogen. Thank you, Dr. Alt. Dr. Alt, do you have a question or comment? Comment, actually. I just wanted to say thank you to the people that collected all that pregnancy data. <clears throat> you know, it's not been that long ago we were talking about the 300,000 healthcare workers among the 20 million healthcare workers that are out there and how that demographic skewed younger and female. And so I think this data will be very reassuring to the people who've already been vaccinated as well as, as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Palin. Um, two things. I've got a comment and a question. First, a special thank you to Drs. Lee and Shimabukuro and your entire teams. Um, following the safety of these in real time uh, is incredibly important and demonstrates great confidence. And um, I um, know that this is enormous effort and just want to say thank you for paying attention and paying attention to the pregnancy. Um, I've got a question. If we go back to slide 21, I wanted to ask, um, the venous thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism looks higher um, than the expected and would like just a chance for you to comment on that. Thank you. So it's it's early on, um, it's early right now, and um, follow up time can impact these expected events. And um, I was discussing this um, with some some of our statisticians yesterday, and um, what they what they told me is the the reason sometimes you have small number like zero expected is because um, some of these rare events you haven't accumulated follow up time. And I, I think the strength of our analysis is that our other, our other, um, the other, uh, the other analysis we're doing right now. If you flip back one slide, so this is an unvaccinated concurrent comparator analysis. So this this is does not rely on unvaccinated individuals um, basically moving into the uh, moving through the moving through their follow-up time so you can compare certain vaccinated individuals with other vaccinated individuals. In this case, we have vaccinated versus unvaccinated, and so you can accumulate time right away. So um, although there are limitations to this unvaccinated concurrent comparator analysis, in the early stages, and we're still fairly early, um, this, this was the, the, this was a way to look at the get data as quickly as possible. Um, and, and get an idea of what was happening with these um, with associations and whether there was any statistically significant increased risks. Now, if you move to the next slide, so we're we're, we're in the process of transitioning into this analysis, and I think um, we need to accumulate more data and let some more of these vaccinated individuals um, move through. Um, you know, accumulate follow-up time, and then that is going to impact some of these numbers in that expected uh, events uh, in that expected events column. But importantly, we are doing sequential analyses on these statistical analyses on these, and um, according to our, our our thresholds, we have not um, we have we have not observed any statistical signals for any of these outcomes. Thank you. Ms. Bata. Thank you, Dr. Shimabu Carl. I always appreciate these um, updates and efforts that you um, put in to provide this very salient information. Um, can you say anything about um, what Lisa is looking at when it relates to nervous system disorders? So these are primarily serious neurologic adverse events, um, and I don't, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know what specific events, but these are things like Guillain-Barre syndrome and other, and other um, acute demyelinating disorders. Um, keep in mind, because there are temporally associated cases of 
of um, serious neurologic events does not imply that there's a causal association or a safety problem. These are these are cases where there's a temporally associated event and an astute healthcare provider or a, 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 a public health partner out there is requesting consultation and, and, and CISA will do a deep review into these um, cases and run them through the CISA algorithm. Thank you. Dr. Stinchfield. Thank you, Patsy Stinchfield from NetNex. Safety team, wonderful work. Thank you so much. A comment and a question. This data is so usable to go back to, um, I've got 80% uh, of our Children's Hospital Minnesota staff vaccinated, but there's 10% that have neither opted in or opted out. They're the people that are waiting. They're kind of watching. And I think this data is going to be extremely helpful to them um, about the, the safety. So thank you for that. And um, my question is related to our earlier conversation. I'm wondering, Tom, if you have considered adding a question to VSAFE yet around, um, have you had a lab confirmed case of COVID? And if this wouldn't be a good time to do it as we're adding a third product. Thank you. Um, we do ask about uh, COVID disease after vaccination, um, which, uh, you know, assessing, assessing I don't, that in some cases that may be breakthrough disease, in some cases it may, it may not, depending on the timing of the vaccination. So we do ask that question on subsequent um, surveys. Um, we haven't asked that question um, prior to, and there was, we had some long discussions. I don't remember the specifics of why we chose not to include that. However, I will say um, to get at this issue of reactogenicity in people that have been previously infected with COVID, um, we have uh, in, in progress, and it's in the planning stages right now, a, a nested case control study planned in VSAFE where we are going to uh, assess reactogenicity um, in, in, in recipients, and then and then um, and then select cases and select controls, and then go back, contact these individuals, and ask them about um, prior infection. Um, I know that there's a lot of interest out there about um, this issue of reactogenicity and whether um, prior symptomatic infection may um, predispose an individual to ha having more reactogenicity, and we thought that that was the best way to analyze this data in VSAFE. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arthur. Thank you so much. Uh, great presentations. Really uh, glad to have them. Like Patsy, I think they're very useful. Thank you very much for including the background rates. I think that is really important in helping people look at this data and also make sure that it's the, the explanations of these incidences within the vaccinated group are explained well to the general public. I also wonder if it would be worthwhile with slide eight or nine where you break out the dose one and dose two reactogenicity to show the data by age. I, I, I'm hearing anecdotally that there's much more reactogenicity in younger people. So I wonder if it would be good to see how those, those two data split out by the different age groups as we communicate to people what to expect. Sure, that's a, that's a great suggestion. We have a, a study um, going on right now looking at reactogenicity um, and it's it's much more um, detailed and in-depth than than the what what I presented um, on those two tables so uh, I will certainly take that back to our investigators and uh, and run that past them if they're not doing that already dr. Hayes Yes, Carol Hayes with the American College of Nurse Midwives. I just wanted to thank you so much for this. And I, I, I want to reiterate that the background rates are critical when you're talking about adverse events in pregnancy. So I really appreciate that. And I know that I emailed you, Tom, about um, the small number of people enrolled in VSAFE, and you actually were incredibly excited by how many people had enrolled. I thought it was small. You were excited. Um, but I will say that I volunteered at two clinics where most of the people working the clinics did not know about Be Safe. So I feel like we're still missing the promotion of this on some level. And I, you know, I don't have a solution, but I just want to reiterate that I've I've had 10 friends that got vaccinated and none of them have been told about Be Safe. Um, and I also wanted to ask you if you are um 
I read recently that there has been um, some concern about women getting a mammogram immediately after getting vaccinated because of the lymphadenopathy and it would have a false positive mammogram. And I'm wondering if um, what you've heard about that and, and if you're monitoring that. Uh, I have to, to your first point, I think we acknowledge that uh, the um, accessibility of vSafe has been somewhat inconsistent. So we'll certainly speak to our, um, our, our communication folks to, to just to maintain awareness of vSafe as it rolls out more broad, as the vaccination rolls out more broadly. Um, the issue of, of uh, lymph, I guess it's lymphadenopathy and, and mammograms. I, I had, I, I am aware of that um, issue. Uh, I would say that that type of recommendation, um, I think, would be more in our with our clinical group. Um, so I would defer to our clinical folks, the the, the folks that issue the clinical recommendations um, uh, about that. Um, I'll just say that lymphadenopathy and lymphadenitis. Um, yes, we have observed um, that in our in our in our post authorization safety monitoring. I had one other quick question. Um, have Has there been any way to track uh, whether or not reactogenicity is related to body mass index? Uh, and I don't. A friend of mine asked me this because she said everyone she knows that's thin has been highly reactogenic, but she knows people that are overweight that are not. And so I don't know if there's any science to that or not. Um. We haven't looked. We th that's not one of the variables we use in our surveillance. Um, so I can't really comment on that or whether that's biologically plausible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Long. Yes, add my kudos along with everyone else's. It's just remarkable to have so much data already. My question relates to the um, expected occurrence rate, um, background occurrence rate, and uh, specifically related to pregnancy outcomes. Um, I assume that background uh, pregnancy from the medical literature outcomes is everybody. Uh, and we do know that there is overrepresentation in adverse outcomes of pregnancy in very young pregnant women in racially um, uh, differentiation as well as socioeconomic. I assume this background rate that you quoted was for everyone, and I assume that you, there is no um, attempt to try to match for outcomes by age, race, socioeconomic, et cetera. And it makes me worry just a little bit that I suspect that the vaccinated pregnant women are more likely to be white, educated, uh, socioeconomically advantaged. I, I don't know that. I don't know if we have data on that, but you probably do somewhere. So do you, do you want to just say something if you think that could make you concerned? I just looked at the stillbirth. Uh, I think it was 1% for vaccinees and 0.5 for the medical literature. Do you have any concerns about um, mismatching of the groups you're looking at? Well, I, 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 would, I would say that part of enrolling um, women into the Be Safe Pregnancy Registry is doing a detailed intake interview. So we will likely get some of that demographic information. And um, when the, I think when the VSAFE Pregnancy registry um, begins to um, form up, and when we begin to get um, uh, larger numbers and get more detailed information on a larger number of individuals, we may be able to look at at um, some of these um, do some of these subgroup analyses. I mean, right right now, um, there's right now it's these are still fairly small numbers, um, and, and and so I don't really think that. Um, I don't really think we have the data right now that will allow us to do these detailed sub-analyses, but I think that's that is a possibility um, as we continue to develop the the VSA pregnancy registry. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Dr. Sanchez. Oh, thank you. Say no. Um, I really just wanted to to thank Tom and and Grace and the group because. It's a spectacular job, and 
really offers a lot of reassurance. And um, wanting to go back to the um, capturing who has had a SARS-CoV-2 infection before the vaccine. And I'm glad to know that you're going to be doing a nested case control, but it really would be helpful to add that question. I think it'd be a very simple one because it's something that people do know. Um, and then in terms of the pregnancy, um, it'll be, I'm, I know you're adding, you'll be adding the, um, you know, the current uh, Janssen product. So I think it'll be really interesting as new platforms are developed to look at these, um, you know, at the safety and adverse events, including overall, um, you know, um, overall side effects, um, you know, specific side effects by vaccine type. So, uh, so anyway, um, congratulations, really. This is really nice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dushin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, critical information. My question is, and forgive me if I missed this, for which systems do we have race and ethnicity data? We have race ethnicity for VAERS. Um, it's captured on the, the standard VAERS 2.0 reporting form. And we uh, have added race and ethnicity to the vSAFE um, system. Um, both on an on, on initial intake for new entrants, and then uh, sort of on a, we, we, we've 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 um, we've structured so people who who are in the system um, when they go back and do a VSafe check in, they get that question again. So we'll get information on VSafe, and then in the vaccine safety data link, we do have information on race and ethnicity as well. Thank you. And so, I, I, can I assume that your team is as sufficient numbers of um, outcomes are accumulated routinely analyzing um, the data um, stratifying by race and ethnicity? So in VAERS is, is spontaneous reporting um, subject to reporting biases and not necessarily representative of the population. And then, you know, VSAFE is a voluntary uh, self-enrollment system. Um, which may not be generalizable. So though we're, we are, um, you know, we collect uh, information on race and ethnicity, and we do analyze that. Um, we've been analyzing that data as well. Um, it, it, I think we have to be careful um, about drawing conclusions from, uh, from race and ethnicity um, in, in those two systems, given the limitations of those systems. Um, for VSD, we do we do capture that, so there is the the option to um, to to uh, do some population based analysis potentially. We'll say one of the the limitations is when you start slicing the data um, very finely. So you're looking at by age, by vaccine, by dose of vaccine, by race. Um, you can see the problem where the, the the finer you slice it, the smaller numbers you get, and you can run into small numbers problems. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I, I guess I I probably should I was did not express that well. I was wondering about participation rates. Oh, um, uh, well, I think I I think we'll um, uh, for for VSafe, well, which you know is a self enrollment voluntary system, we will will definitely be able to get participation. Um, it, it may not. It may not be necessarily representative, but we'll we'll know um, you know who's enrolling in VSafe by race and ethnicity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alt. I just wanted to <clears throat> pardon me. I just wanted to follow up to Dr. Long's comments uh, and also uh, some of the other comments. Um, when you start looking at obstetrical outcomes like preterm birth, there's certainly uh, a risk factor of, of being black in America is a risk for that. However, when you start getting into things like stillbirth and miscarriage, you get into things that have, you know, 15 or 20 recognized risk factors, and you're going to get into what was mentioned previously as slicing and dicing the data into such small groups. It's probably not going to be meaningful. So, I, and to go back to what I said previously, you know, we did one of the reasons that healthcare workers uh, we're put at the front of the line. One of our original recommendations is that um, 
of course, we were concerned about their occupational exposure, but also they were a very diverse group because we had such a broad definition of what was a healthcare worker. So it's not all skewed towards upper socioeconomic status. Thank you for those comments. Dr. Leger. Hi, Marie-Michelle Leger from American Academy of PAs. Um, thank you uh, for the excellent presentation. My question is a follow-up to what Phyllis had asked um, as far as teasing the data for uh, by gender as far as reactogenicity. And the reason I'm asking is because anecdotally, we have seen that more women are reporting uh, side effect after the second dose of the vaccine, the mRNA vaccine. I I um I, I will I will certainly take that back to the folks doing our reactogenicity study in VSafe. Um, like I said, that they, they may be looking at that already, but um, you know certainly there's you know we've observed that in the past as well, um, especially with uh, um, with 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 VAERS reporting. So um, it's certainly something that we can look at. Uh, uh, Dr. Daly. Um, thanks. So, uh, Dr. Shimabukuro, just thanks for that that excellent presentation. And, I, and I'm kind of amazed at your ability to sort of integrate data across multiple systems while while highlighting the various strengths and limitations of the systems. Um, quick question: um, Do you think our ability to monitor post authorization safety of the Janssen vaccine will be a little bit more limited for two reasons? One is initial doses may not be quite as high as what we saw for Moderna and Pfizer in those first couple of weeks. And then a second being, if the Janssen vaccines used in other sites like mass vaccination clinics or something, I wonder whether the visibility of vSafe in those settings will be even lower. So I'm just speculating and trying to look ahead over the next couple of weeks, but, but do you think we'll have a little bit more limitations for uh, surveillance of Janssen vaccine? I guess it's I guess that's possible. I would say we're we're going to conduct enhanced surveillance um for the 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 Janssen vaccine um in VAERS. Um and, and there are some um there are some things that we can we can do and be safe um to to get um early quick visibility on the, the Janssen vaccine um like uh, over enroll in the pregnancy registry um um to you know to Trying to even out the numbers, but certainly for uh, for for um, VAERS, we are we are going to uh, uh, be monitoring the the Janssen vaccine with the with the same intensity that we monitored the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine when those rolled out in their in their initial weeks of, of vaccination. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that ends that presentation, and I believe we have, let me just check the schedule, um, a, a short break of 15 minutes, five minutes, I've been told. Um, uh, so we'll come back in five minutes. Thank you very much.